Perhaps a staple of all world mythologies is the presence of extraordinary and strange beasts. From the Minotaur and Cyclops of Greek myth, to the many bizarre yokai of Japanese folklore. But what about the Bible? In this video, let's take a look at four unusual creatures found in the Old Testament and examine where academics believe these strange beasts may have come from. Unicorns Ok, this should be familiar territory. Horses with horns, we all know what unicorns look like. Surprisingly, they're actually mentioned quite a few times in the Bible. In the book of Numbers, it describes God as being like a unicorn. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Another example is in the book of Job, where God rhetorically asks, Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee, or abide by thy crib? Now, if you've watched some of my other videos, you'll know that a great place to start is looking at the original language. In Hebrew, they're not called unicorns. Instead, they're simply called re'em. Remember this word, re'em. We'll come back to it in a second. When the Greeks began translating the Bible, they translated this Hebrew word, re'em, to monokeros, which simply means one horn. Similarly, Latin speakers translated the word as unicornis, from which we get our word, unicorn. Speaking of Greeks and Romans, strangely, unicorns do not feature in their mythologies. Instead, they are featured in ancient Greco-Roman natural encyclopedias, basically ancient textbooks on nature. This is all to say that people did not think unicorns were mythical beasts, but actually real-life creatures. As real as a cow, lion, or horse. Why? Well, it's a case of mistaken identity. This one-horned creature is actually a rhino. When early travellers went to faraway lands, they spoke of strange creatures they saw on their way. One was called a unicorn. For example, Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder offers his description of a unicorn as a very fierce animal called the unicorn, which is the head of a stag, the feet of an elephant, and the tail of a boar, while the rest of the body is like that of a horse. Scholars believe that Pliny is offering an imperfect description of a rhino. It is likely that he heard a second-hand or even third-hand description of one, and is recounting it in this book. The description of a rhino became distorted with each telling, a bit like a game of telephone. So, returning back to the Bible and unicorns, we can see how the original description of a rhino may have been distorted when it first got translated. Remember the Hebrew word for unicorn, re'em? Well, it doesn't mean rhino, but a creature rather similar. The re'em has now been identified as an animal the nearby Akkadians called the rimu. Today, we'd call it an aurochs, an ancient ancestor of modern-day cattle. So, when the Bible talks about unicorns and so on, it's actually referring to an ancient type of bull. So now, it's a case of a triple mistaken identity. Originally, the Bible described a bull, which was then misinterpreted as a unicorn, which itself was a misinterpretation of a rhino. A bit convoluted, but hey. Okay, next beast. Leviathan and Behemoth. These are perhaps the most famous mythical creatures in the whole Bible. Ones you may be familiar with. The Behemoth and Leviathan appear in the book of Job. As part of a wider speech, God offers an extensive description of each creature. Let's start with the behemoth. It's a gigantic land creature of immense strength. Here's the full description. Behold, behemoth, which I made as I made you. He eats grass like an ox. Behold, his strength in his loins, and his power in the muscles of his belly. He makes his tail stiff like a cedar, his sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs like bars of iron. He is the first of the works of God. Let him who made him bring near his sword. For the mountains yield food for him, where all the wild beasts play. Under the lotus plants he lies, in the shelter of the reeds and in the marsh. For his shade the lotus trees cover him, the willows of the brook surround him. Behold, if the river is turbulent, he is not frightened. He is confident, though Jordan rushes against his mouth. Can one take him by his eyes, or pierce his nose with a snare? Now just after this description comes the Leviathan. This creature is a giant sea monster. 
serpentine, scaly, and very ferocious. The description is a bit longer than beer moths, so I won't read out in full. Only some select verses, so you get the picture. His back is made of rows of shields, shut up closely as with a seal. One is so near the other, so that no air can come between them. Out of his mouth go flaming torches, sparks of fire leap forth. Out of his nostrils comes forth smoke, as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals, and a flame comes forth from his mouth. Can you fill his skin with harpoons, or head with fishing spears? Lay your hands on him, remember the battle, you will not do it again. So some scholars have tried the same tactic applied with a unicorn, finding a real life counterpart to match these descriptions. Let's start with a beer moth, a large land animal that eats grass like an ox and is known for its incredible strength, but mostly just relaxes in shaded waters. If you guessed a hippo, you'd be right. Okay, how about a leviathan? An aquatic reptile that has tough scaly skin and rows of sharp teeth. Did you think of a crocodile? So, potentially, God is not describing two mythical beasts, but simply two real-life animals, just with a bit of pizzazz. At one point in time, this view was really popular amongst scholars, but it's had its problems over the years, mostly with the Leviathan. How do we account for the creature's fiery breath or its serpentine appearance? Plus, the Leviathan lives in the depths of the seas, whereas crocodiles typically live in fresh water. Another popular theory hopes to offer a better explanation. These are not descriptions of real animals, but instead really are descriptions of mythical beasts with great power. See, the Leviathan has a bit of a history with this one. In a bunch of myths across the world, especially creation myths, there's a trope of gods doing battles with sea monsters just like the Leviathan. The Germans called it the Chaos Kampf, or Primordial Battle. For example, in the Babylonian creation myth, the Enuma Elish, the chief god Marduk defeats the sea beast Tiamat and creates the land, sea and sky with her dismembered body. A very similar story comes from an ancient Canaanite myth in which the sea beast Lotan is slayed by the chief god Baal at the start of creation. In fact, the name Lotan is generally believed to be where we get the name Leviathan in the first place. The Chaos Camp appears more than just the Middle East. The Norse god Thor battles with the world serpent Jormungandr. The Greek god Zeus slays the serpentine Typhon. The Hindu deity Indra defeats the aquatic snake demon Vitra. And even as far as Japan, we have the Shinto storm god Susanoo, who slays the eight-headed sea serpent Yamata no Orochi. So out of this, we get the idea of the Leviathan, this primordial sea snake of creation. But note that in the book of Job, God's not doing battle with the Leviathan. Instead, he's celebrating its majesty, and it all seems to invert the trope on its head. Oh, and the counterpart Behemoth? Sadly, it's not really well known where it comes from. Some say it's a giant mythical cow. After all, its name, Behemoth, is related to the Hebrew word for cattle, Behema. With this, they suspect that it could be related to a giant bull in the Epic of Gilgamesh that was sent down from heaven to do battle with the heroes, Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Who knows? The jury's out on this one. Perhaps the beer moth is some sort of other creature that only ever appears here in this part of the Bible and nowhere else. The Nephilim. Final creatures for now, the Nephilim, literally translating to the fallen ones, but often just called the giants. I touched on them in a video about the origins of Lucifer, but to summarize, the Nephilim are said to be the offspring of a forbidden procreation between angels and the humans. This story is expounded on at length in the apocryphal book of Enoch, where they cause havoc and generally just cause a bit of a mess. Now, that's an apocryphal account and not in the mainstream Bible canon. So if we limit it just to the Bible, there isn't really much about them. In Genesis, they are said to be warriors of renown. And in the book of Numbers, the Israelites describe themselves as being the size of grasshoppers in comparison to them. The real debate is whether we take it literally or if they're just being emphatic. Maybe these are just exaggerated descriptions of real life warriors. Well, the book of Enoch takes it literally and even goes a step further, measuring the Nephilim at a whopping 1.35 kilometers, that's 4,500 feet tall. But who knows? The book of Enoch is just one of many interpretations. A clue could be in the earliest translations of the Bible, which follow the same pattern 
and translate Nephilim as gigantes, which, by the way, is where we get our word for giants. So, there we have it. I find that reading the texts in their original language really reveals a lot about ancient texts like the Bible. The New Testament, especially the book of Revelations, has some really wacky creatures, like dragons and creatures covered entirely with eyes, perhaps a topic for a future video. Either way, I really hope you enjoyed this video, and if you're new here, subscribe! A like and a comment also goes a long way. It's great to see so much activity on this channel and so many positive responses to my content. I might wish to produce more videos on mythology and biblical studies in the future, but I'm open to any and all suggestions. Who knows, next week's topic could be entirely different. And by the way, this channel has a Discord. Check the link in the description. Head on there and join the discussion. Anyway, I look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.